All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I've just uh, started the recording of this session, so we are good to go. Um, so Romans chapter 1, and we were looking at verse 20. What Paul is saying is, you know, uh, um, the wrath of God is revealed against all the sin of this world, people. But, uh, you know, what are people doing? They are suppressing the truth. They're pressing it down, holding it down. But God has uh, made things very clear. And Paul points to creation. He points to things God has made. And he's saying the invisible attributes of God. His power, his Godhead, the very nature of deity is made very plain. So that, he says, we are without excuse. You know, so what I was mentioning earlier is um, you can't hear me. I don't know if it's my mic. I no, I can mic. hear you fast. You can? Yeah, okay. it's the same. Yeah, it's good. Okay. All right. Um, so what I was saying was that uh, many people, you know, they make the excuse. Uh, if God reveals himself to me, I'll believe there is a God. If there is a God, let him show himself to me. I mean, things like that, you know. They may say it in different words. But God has given us enough evidence. And that evidence is, he says, creation, the things he has made. And the invisible attributes of God are seen in his creation. And we know we can actually think about this. What are the attributes of God? You know, the wisdom of God. Well, you look at, you know, where you can take a single cell, uh, you can look at uh, so many things in creation. It's like, wow, that is, you know, it's, I'm just using the word brilliant, but it's beyond brilliant. There's, it's just amazing. Uh, the detail, the design uh, uh, that is that is there, you know. And Paul is telling us God has revealed Himself to us in His creation, so we are without excuse. Okay. So, creation is God's big signpost that He's there, and uh, we can't. We have that excuse. We can't say God didn't reveal himself to me. However, what Paul is telling is this, verse 21. I'm, I'm just going forward from verse 21 to 23. However, here's the problem. That even though people knew this, that, hey, creation is so brilliant, creation is so great, uh, it has to be the work of God, even though they knew God, verse 21. They're making a choice. They did not glorify him as God, verse 21. But they became futile, vain, useless in their thinking. Their hearts were darkened. And professing to be wise, they became fools. So here's a deliberate deviation, a deliberate departure from truth. They knew God. It's like, wow, look at creation. I mean, this can't be an accident. This has to be, this is a masterpiece. It's the work of the creator, the work of the great designer. So they knew that, but still, they chose to become foolish in their thinking. They chose to, uh, you know, uh, just just 
be fools, professing to be wise. So say, look, 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 we've got a scientific explanation or we've got a, an explanation for how everything came into the existence. So professing to be wise, they actually became fools. Verse 23, or verse 22, and verse 23. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God to things that they, uh, to corruptible man, birds and food, four-footed animals and so on. So instead of worshiping God for his glory, they began to look at corruptible things, things that will pass away. And they brought, you know, the great creator God to become like man, animals, creeping things. And then he continues. Let's read verse 24 to 32, please. Somebody could read that. Uh, actually, it's a, um, uh, let's read verse 24 to 27, then we will read after that. So let's just read verse 24 to 27. 24 to 27? Yes, please. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the life and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave, gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving their natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the plenty of their error which was due. Mm. Okay. So, because man chose, thank you, because man chose to do this, that means he knew God, but he didn't want to glorify God. Instead, he departed from that and began to focus in on, you know, he changed the glory of God into corruptible things, man, animals, creeping things, focus on that. Two times in this passage here, we see it says, God gave them up in verse 24 and again in verse 26. God gave them up, meaning God just let them go. Fine, that's the way you want to think. That's what you want to do. Okay. Right. So it's showing us something here that God, while this is not the best and this is not what God really desires, God is, you know, respecting the fact that we are free moral agents, free moral beings, free will beings. And you say, okay, that's what you want. That's the way you want to go. God gave them up. He let him go. And it tells us he let them go on into uncleanness, verse 24. And how unclean could, could man get? They dishonored their bodies among themselves. So he gave them up and they went all the way to this extreme of dishonoring their bodies among themselves. And then he kind of recaps that. He says in verse 25, what did they do? He, he's explaining what he meant in verse 23. What did they do when they changed the glory of the incorruptible God um, to birds and four-footed beasts. What 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 exactly what did he mean by that? Verse twenty-five. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they began to worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator. So you can imagine the people started, you know, worshiping created things instead of worshiping the Creator God, and. Verse 26, 
they went on and their God gave them up to their wild passions. Even women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. And verse 27. So what he's explaining now what he meant by they were dishonoring the bodies among themselves. What was it? He's saying they were burning, verse 27, they were burning in lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful. So women with women, men with men. So really it's like this is the climax or the high point of being wild in our being wild in our passions and dishonoring God in our bodies. This is what it is. It's like the ultimate of uncleanness and being wild. So, you know, if we pause here and think about this, this is such a big issue in our day, in our time. Now, obviously, it was there way back 2,000 years ago and way back in the time of Noah. So it's not new sin, but and you know, women with women, women and men with men. It's not a new kind of thing. It was way back there in the book of Genesis. And it was there during Paul's time. So he's obviously writing about it. And it's there in our day and time. But the Bible is very clear. This is wrong. Not only is this wrong, it's saying in verse 26, these are wild passions. It's against nature. It's against God's natural design. It's against it. Now, when you look at what is happening globally, now for us in India, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a big issue yet. To some extent, there is, you know, uh, there is, uh, People are talking about it and so on. But in other parts of the world, this is a big thing. And it, it's, it's mainstream uh, when, uh, you know, uh, homosexuality in all of its forms and expressions uh, are, you know, are, are, they demand to be accepted as natural, as normal. And here we are seeing in scripture, it says, no, it's not. This is not the way God intended or God designed it. It is against the way, it's a dishonoring of our bodies. It is against natural use. It is an expression of wild passions, but God gave them up. He says, that's what you're choosing, go your way. And uh, I don't want to, you know, kind of go into uh, uh, necessarily discussion at this point on, you know, how should the church respond? But, you know, this, uh, we must be aware of, I mean, what I want to highlight here is the scriptures are very clear that this is wrong. Just not God's thing. Be able to. I think my line just. Maybe my line dropped a minute there. Um, you know how the church responds to all of this is is a totally another area that we need to talk about. Uh, that the, the church needs to move with love, and yet at the same time move in truth. We cannot compromise the truth. Neither can we not walk in love, right? So we have to walk in love, we have to walk in truth. And so we have to balance the two, and then we have to 
uh, reach people. Right? But that's something, that's a big area that, that needs to be addressed. But let's finish up now in chapter one. We'll read verse 28 to verse 32, please. Somebody could read it. Okay, sir, I'll read. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a dispersed mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, cover, covetousness, biliousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are worshippers, backbeaters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiveness, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteousness, judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of that, not only do the same, but also, also pray of those who practice them. Okay, thank you. So, what, what is Paul saying? The way to retain God, the way you're choosing to go, okay, I'm letting you go. Pastor, sorry, Pastor, so, uh, come again. Your voice, okay. broke, your video and voice, little disturbed for network. Okay, okay. All right, I'll do that. Okay, so once again, now we, we're looking at verses 28 to 32. So people chose not to retain God. And this is okay. We don't want God in the picture. We chose not to retain God. And you know, this is something we are seeing happen even in our day. No, if we don't want God. We don't want don't talk about God. Don't talk to me about God. People chose not to retain God. And then what, what Paul says is God gave them up. So for the third time in this so far in this passage, Paul is using that same phrase, God gave them up. The first time is in verse 24. He gave them up to uncleanness. Our second time, verse 26, he gave them up to wild passions. Third time, verse 28, he gave them up to a debased mind, uh, a mind that is just corrupt, and it is uh, literally thinking the wrong way. It's going the wrong way. So that's how you're going to go. You're choosing to go. God gave them up. He gave them up to their uncleanness, to their wild passions, to a debased mind. And, and then, you know, then he lists all kinds of things. Man is doing out of a pursuit of uncleanness, wild passions, and in a debased mind. He lists all kinds of things that man is doing. But he says, it ends up that, that those who do these things, they are deserving of death. There are going to be eternal consequences to these things. Right? So Paul is now developing uh, this whole journey of And then how, how is salvation possible? And then he goes into talking about faith and salvation through Jesus Christ. Right? So he's actually building up towards the message of Christ. Okay. So in chapter two, are, are we? All right. You just lost me again. Okay. I don't know why the line is a little uh, patchy today, but 
so what am I saying is in chapter one, after all the introduction, Paul is, you know, he's, 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 he's writing in a very, very logical way. He starts off by talking about creator and creation and the sinfulness of man, the, the depravity of man, which is what we have just read, that God has given man up to this. Okay, that's what, it's your, your choice. Then in chapter two, which we will get into now, he deals with the issue of law and conscience. Okay, both with respect to Jews and the Gentiles. So it's very interesting uh, debate almost in chapter two, where Paul is debating within himself or you know, with the mind of the readers, the whole issue of law and conscience with respect to Jews and with respect to the Gentiles. And then he develops that in chapter three to the whole issue of sin, sinfulness. Chapter four, the issue of faith. And chapter five, how can we be, be made righteous? Remember he said in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. He's going there, chapter five, the righteousness of God is revealed, right? But let me introduce chapter two and then we will get into it. In chapter two, and again, these notes have been put up in the coursework section so chapter by chapter there's a pdf so each time you get into a chapter you know we can get into a new pdf so that you have a question please go ahead yeah so i was just wondering what it was 24 and 26 where it says therefore god gave them over in the sinful desires mm -hmm. so in verse 26 says because of this god gave them over to shameful lust so is like, mm -hmm. it the one god is giving them the sinful desires or you know, how is it? God gave them, so. Oh. so uh, God gave them up to these things. That means, uh, or, or if you put it in a simpler English, we would say, God let them go to, God let them go in their pursuit of uncleanness. God let them go in their pursuit of evil passions. God let them go as they followed their own debased mind, right? So it's not like God is giving them the unclean passions or obviously God is good and he cannot do that. But God is letting them go towards, you know, because they are making the choice. He's letting them go into what they want, okay? Now, go ahead, Roshan, you have a question? Pastor, yes, thank you. Um, so. Uh, from verse 1 to 17, we see that uh, it's a, a grand um, uh, introduction like Paul is giving, right? And then from verse 18 onwards, he starts addressing the issues. Um, now, unlike uh, other letters, like where Paul addresses to a certain uh, a church, uh, like certain issues or challenges that the church is experiencing. Now, when Paul says all these, uh, you know, uh, issues from verse 18 to all the way down to uh, the last verse of chapter 1, is he generally saying the the challenges and the issues that uh, the mankind in general are uh, going through all over the world, or is he specifically addressing uh, the people in the Rome? Or mm -hmm. who is he addressing, Pastor? Yeah. So, good question. So, uh, Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome is different from his other epistles, like you pointed out, the other epistles were specific to a group of believers. Corinth, he was addressing, first and second Corinth is addressing problems at Corinth, Galatians addressing problems there, and so on. So they were very specific to a group of people. Here, of course, he's writing to the believers at Rome, but Paul's epistle to Rome is a very doctrinal in nature. It's a teaching where he's, he's not, you don't find him necessarily addressing specific issues uh, that had to deal with the challenges of the, of the church in Rome. No, it's more or, more or less teaching that It applies to all believers. Part of this, there are certain things that are you know, amongst other believers in Rome. 
for instance, uh, what about Jews and Gentiles? That's uh, definitely a big issue there because um, they were Jewish believers initially, but later on the Gentile leaders emerged in the Church of Rome. So what's happening there? Secondly, how do we relate to civil government? They were Jews, Gentiles, but they had the Roman government there. How do we relate to them? So that's addressed in chapter 13. And uh, then there is this whole issue of yeah, food uh, and, and uh, those kinds of things, chapter 14. So, uh, and then chapter 16 is, you know, he's just greeting people who are at Rome. So towards the latter part of uh, the episode, yeah, he gets into some specifics um, that would be on the minds of the believers at Rome. But up until then, it's, it's, it's teaching, it's doctrine that is for all believers everywhere. So he's not addressing something specific to or only to the believers in Rome. Yeah. So that's how this, this episode to the Romans differs you know, from a lot of the other episodes. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, you have a question? Yes, Pastor. Uh, I, just, I just had a, a, a practical kind of thing. If I hope this doesn't happen in our churches, uh, but if, um, how would you personally deal with those who, if someone in your church, you found out that he or she is involved in homosexuality, how, what kind of procedure or things would you, would, uh, would a church should be doing? Uh, either counseling or uh, talking with them. Mm. Yeah. So this definitely is, uh, you know, a, a challenging question, but it is a very important question. It's challenging because it is, you know, it is a, it is, it is causing a, a lot of discussion not only within the church, but even from outside the church. And let me just put it in a very concise way. Um, so one, like, like we said, we have to walk in love. We have to walk in truth. People are people and people need to be loved, right? So whether a person is a, a, a female who is a homosexual, a male who is an homosexual, they are people. They need to be loved. But then there is truth, the word of God. And God, as we read here, God is very clear in this and in other, passage, other passages. Look, this is unnatural. This is not the way God designed you. This is not uh, approved by God. So that is truth the, as we stand by. And we can't change the Bible. Many of you Christians and believing the Bible. Well, this is what the Bible says. We have to follow the Word of God. Uh, you can't say the Word of God is outdated. No, the Word of God is for all time, for all people, and it is truth. Truth doesn't change with time. Truth is eternal. Truth is absolute. So that is truth. We have to. So how do we help the people without comp how, how do we walk in love but not compromise the truth? That's the question. And here's what, you know, and, and, and this is what I believe. I believe that we love people. And if they are willing, we can't force this on anybody and we shouldn't force it on anybody. But if they are willing, we can share with them the truth. We can share with them the word of God. And as we minister the truth of the word, like Paul only has shared, the gospel is the power of God. The message of Jesus is the power of God. We don't have to force it on people. We don't have to control and manipulate people. But if they are open, right, we can communicate the truth and trust that God would bring them out by the power of his word, by the power of his spirit, that he would transform them. We can't force it, but if they're open, we can impart and at the same time, we must not compromise the truth. So that means in the church, 
we will not conduct gay marriages because that's that's not Bible in the church. Uh, we cannot have uh, people who are practicing or are choosing to continue that lifestyle to hold positions of leadership. We cannot. Now, we're not going to chase them out of the community. We're going to love them. But in truth, in love, we're going to say, look, that's not acceptable by the, according to the scriptures. Uh, and therefore, there are certain things we cannot permit as a church because we're living by the word of God. Right? So we don't want to force them. Now, uh, just to make a comment here, generally speaking, outside, in the, ch outside the church, uh, they refer to what we do as conversion therapy. That means uh, people from outside, when they look at us saying that, you know, when we, when we present the truth to people who are gay, homosexuals, uh, and try to tell them, look, this is the word they call, you know, what they refer to it as conversion therapy. They're trying to convert them out of homosexuality into being straight, into living a heterosexual life. So they call it conversion therapy. Now, a lot of negative things have been said about conversion therapy. And maybe to some extent, the way it is being done, maybe we are wrong. You know, the way we, we can't force this on people. We can't, uh, you know, do this in a condemning way. Uh, we have to do this in, in a way of in, in love and uh, help let God work in their hearts and lives, right? So perhaps the approach taken by the church in some situations has been very harsh, has been very mean, has been very hurtful. People have been hurt in the process. But uh, what we need to do is to, in a very wise way, walk in love, walk in truth, as you minister to them. We cannot compromise the truth but we don't want to hate people. We don't want to condemn people. So that's the balance we have to seek as we minister to them and depend on the power of God's word and the Holy Spirit to bring about change. Does that help, Dave? Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Something to think about. Thank okay. you. All right. So let's go to chapter two. And, uh, you know, uh, each chapter out notes are in a separate PDF will be uploaded in the class section also in the e-learning portal. Now let us give an introduction to chapter two and then we'll get into reading it. So in chapter two, like I said, Paul is dealing with the issue of the law and conscience. Plus he has to deal with two broad categories of people that is Jews and Gentiles. So for the Jews, they are in a different position, meaning they have the law. I mean, God told them, this is my law. Whereas for the Gentiles, they were not given the law. They don't have the written uh, Old Testament. They were not given that. So how was God going to judge the, the Gentiles, because to the Jews, you can say, and as Paul mentions, they will be held, you know, they've been given the law and they can be judged by the law. But the Gentiles were not given the law. So how is God, God going to judge them? And that's where Paul says, well, there is a law that has been built inside every person. And there are two things. One is reason, second is conscience. That means, Within every person, the way God has designed us, he has already given us two things that, that tell us about God and about what's right and wrong. He's given us a reason. He's given us conscience. So even those who don't have the law, they have reason. They have conscience. Therefore, they are also without excuse. But... Paul concludes, everybody will be judged according to the gospel. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're going to be judged according to the 
gospel. So that's in a nutshell, uh, chapter two. Let's go through it because it's very, very interesting how Paul uh, brings this out, okay? So let's go chapter two. Uh, we will read from verses one through um, 11, I think we can do that, yes. So let's read verses one through 11 and let's uh, look at that. Chapter two, one through 11, please. Okay, chapter 2, 1 through 11. Therefore, thou art in, in, in ex excusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou art judges, does the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to, according to the truth against them which commit such things. And think thou this, O man, that judge judges the, them which do such things, and does the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Or despite it, thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads, uh, leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenient heart treasures up unto thy wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are continuous, contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of person with God. Mm. So, what is Paul developing here? He has already told us, look, man is very sinful. He has suppressed the truth. He has uh, gone after his own unclean desires, his wild passions, and the thoughts of his corrupted mind. He's gone that way. And then he says, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, this is the condition of man. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Even if you are judging someone else, that means if somebody's sitting and saying, hey, look, these people are doing all these wrong things, you, you're, you're judging others, but you also are inexcusable. Because, and now, you know, he's, now he's speaking really to the Jewish people. He says, look, Jews, you know, we can point at the Gentiles and say, oh, look, they're all, all the Gentiles are doing all these things. But we also are inexcusable. We don't have an excuse because when we judge others, we must remember we will also be judged by the same things, by the same standard. It says, uh, verse 1, and if you, you practice the same things, if you yourself are doing the things, you're also going to be judged. Right? I can't just point fingers at others. I will also be judged. And then uh, verse 3, you, you're doing the same thing. You can't escape the judgment of God. Right, and uh, so as he's going on with this, uh, so he says, "Look, uh, uh, and I, I'm skipping verse four. I'll come back to verse four and highlight that." But he says, "You know, everyone, whether you're Jew or Greek, we are going to be judged by what we are doing, the life we're living. We're going to be judged." And there is no partiality with God. And notice he says, Jew first to the Greek. Jew first to the Greek in verse 9 and verse 10. Why is he saying that? Because he's going to explain that a little bit as we go down. He's saying, we are all going to be judged. We can't point fingers at others. Because if we point fingers at others and we ourselves are doing it, we are also going to be judged by the same standards. We're going to be judged uh, 
for everything we do and Jew first, then the Greek. Jew first, then the Greek. There is no partiality with God. Right? So keep this thought here. He's already started saying Jew first, then the Greek. Jew first, then the Greek. Or Jew first, then the Gentile. Jew first, then the Gentile. And God is not partial. Okay? Keep that thought. I just want to highlight verse 4. He says, don't despise the goodness, the patience, the long-suffering of God, because the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So think about that phrase, the goodness of God leads to repentance. So, how does God deal with sinful man? True God is a just God. And his justice has to, you know, demands judgment of all the sin. But how does God deal with sinful man? Paul is saying the goodness of God leads people to repentance. That means true God is judge and he will judge sin. But what God is really trying to do is draw people in by his goodness his forbearance, his mercies, and his uh, uh, long-suffering. He's going to try to do. So this is something to keep in mind, that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. So when we are dealing with the issue of sin and the sinfulness of people, and as, you know, as, We come face to face with sinfulness people. We know sin itself has to be judged. But what about the people? Well, the goodness of God draws them to repentance. The goodness of God draws the people to repentance. So I or we, we must extend or demonstrate the goodness of God. We must demonstrate the mercies of God. I'm not saying, you know, condone the sin or encourage them to sin more. That's not. But as far as the people is concerned, we love them. We extend goodness to them because the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Right. So having what Paul is saying is, look, we have all are doing these wrong things and we are all going to face judgment. We're going to be judged for what we're doing. Do first, then the Greek. He mentions that twice, and he says there is no partiality. Right? But now the whole issue is Jew. Okay, I can understand the Jew being judged because they were given the law. But how are the Gentiles going to be judged? That's what he begins to discuss. Right. So let's read from verse 12 on to verse 20. Verse 12 to 20. Somebody could read that for, for us, please. Chapter 2, 12 to 20. Aaron or Cunan and Thomas or not friends, go ahead. For as many as have sent with outlaw will also perish without law and as many as have saint in the law will be judged by the law for not the hearers of the law are judged in the sight of god but the doors of the law will be justified for when gentiles who do not have the law by the nature do the things in the law this although not having the law are a law to themselves who who shows the law who saw the work of the law written in their heart their consequence also brings a uh, bring witness and between themselves their their thoughts accusing or excel exceeding them in the day when 
in the day when God will judge the secret of man by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent. Bring instructed instruct with the law with uh, out of the law and are the confine confident that you yourself are a guide to guide to the blind a light to those who are in darkness and instructor of the police a teacher of babies having the uh, having the prom of knowledge and truth in the law Mm, thank you, Prince. All right. So Paul has said, Jew first, then the Greek, or then the Gentiles. There is no partiality with God. And then he says, look, if you sin without the law, it means you don't have the law, but you're sinning, you will still perish. It's consequence. It's still judged. And for those who have the law, of course, God is the law itself is going to judge them, right? And um, he says, so now he's dealing with this, you know, verse 13. It's not just if you hear the law, but you've got to keep the law in order to be justified. So there he's driving home the point, and he's going to tell us later that none of us can keep the law, right? But the point is making the point here. Look, if you keep the law, you'll be justified by the law. Right? And then this whole issue of what about the Gentiles who have the law? It says, verse 14, Gentiles, they don't have the law, but by nature, they do things in the law. So it's telling us this, that the way people are designed, we are designed, first of all, with something inside of us that's what is right and what's wrong. So he says, by nature, they do the things. And what is he referring to? So he says, although not having the law are a law to themselves. They don't have the law. They don't have you know, the written scriptures that say, do this and don't do this. And this is good and this is not good. They don't have that. But there's something inside them. And what is that? Verse 15. The law is written in their hearts. What is that? Their conscience. Their conscience tells them, bears witness. So it's their conscience is speaking to them and telling them, this is okay, this is not okay. Accusing, not okay. Excusing, this is okay. So this whole thing of how will people, you know, well, the Gentiles don't have the law. So how can you, you know, how can they have the consciousness of sin? How can they know what is right and wrong? Well, he says, look, by nature, they know what's right and wrong. Why? Because God has written the law in their hearts. They may not have the written law as in the scriptures, but they've got something inside them. They've, you know, if we use modern term terminology, we could say, They've been programmed like this. They've been designed like this. How? Every man is born with a conscience. The law written in their hearts. What is the conscience? It's the law written in their hearts. It's the capacity to know right and wrong, which is built into every person. And so every person has the capacity to know what's right and what's wrong. Now, the conscience can be damaged. That means our ability to know right and wrong can be damaged. And as we see in scripture, the conscience can be seared. Uh, it can be, you know, uh, uh, it comes to a place where it no longer is telling the person this is right and this is wrong. They, they've gone past that. But every person to start with has the law written in their hearts in the form of a conscience in the form of the conscience which tells them what's right and what is wrong okay i'm going to pause here we'll pause here the time is up now we'll pick up here from here in chapter two 
and we'll begin to understand law, conscience, Jew, Gentile, and the gospel, right? Remember, the gospel is there. That's how we started out. So how does it all fit in, right? Um, one thing, and uh, let's make mention of it and we'll wrap up in prayer. One thing, the conscience does not replace the gospel. The conscience does not replace the gospel. The conscience is an alternate law, but it does not replace the gospel. We'll expand on that next week and uh, take it forward, all right? Could somebody uh, close this class in prayer? Uh, we, I know we are out of time. We will close and then we will dismiss, please. Thomas? Uh, Sure, Pastor. Please, thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful time, O oh Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We bless your holy name, Daddy. Thank you for unveiling the truths of Romans, Daddy. Thank you for the wonderful book of Romans. As we're reading this, Father, this just shall live by faith. Thank you, Father, for your truths. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Father, thank you for this wonderful book. As we read, Father, let me live by faith in Jesus Christ and spread the gospel, not condemn anyone but to share the goodness and hate sin and share the love of God and see the goodness of God lead the people to repentance. We thank you for this wonderful time. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your mercy and grace. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for being on the class today. Uh, we'll meet again and continue this next week.